Hello everybody and welcome back to another anatomy video. Today we have a good one. We're going to be looking at the anatomy of the shoulder in some detail on an MRI scan. Now you might be wondering why I have an x-ray up if we're going to be looking at an MRI scan. And I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. I feel like with MRI, a single slice, people often get confused because their understanding of the surrounding anatomy is poor. And I want to just cover some of those anatomical structures here on an x-ray first. Now the great thing about an x-ray is you can see the joint in its entirety. You're not just looking at a single slice. And we can see all the structures from anterior to posterior overlaid over each other. Now the way we're going to approach each MRI is by firstly looking at the bones, then looking at the ligaments, moving on to the capsule and the labrum of the glenohumeral joint, and lastly looking at the rotator cuff muscles that surround the shoulder. So let's identify those structures here, make sure we know how they relate to one another before heading on to an MRI scan. So we'll start with the bones. We can see, we should all know that the clavicle comes across here and attaches by the AC joint to the acromion here. So we have our acromion of our scapula here. Anteriorly coming forward is our coracoid process. This is a really important landmark when we're looking at MRI scans. We can see our shallow glenoid fossa of our glenoid here, and we can see the scapula posteriorly here behind the lung fields all the way up and the spine of our scapula coming across to our acromion there. We can see our humerus here with our humeral head that's going to articulate with this glenoid fossa. This is our glenohumeral joint that we're going to be covering here. And you can see how those bones relate to one another. And the most important thing here to remember is the coracoid process is coming out anteriorly and our acromion is posteriorly. And when we're in an MRI, we can use those landmarks to try and figure out our orientation of our MRI slice. Then let's have a look at some of the ligaments. We've got our coracoclavicular ligaments coming up here, attaching the coracoid to the clavicle, distal clavicle. We've mentioned our AC, our acromioclavicular joint here. And we've got a really important coracoacromial ligament that comes across here and makes the roof of our coracoacromial arch that we'll cover later in MRIs. We also have some ligaments that stabilize the joint itself. We've got our superior, our middle, and our inferior glenohumeral ligaments. Now you can see I've drawn that inferior glenohumeral ligament with a long looping segment like that. And that's because when we lift our humerus, we need space for that ligament to then stretch over. And the whole shoulder is a balance between finding stability in the joint. You can see it's a really shallow joint and it takes quite a lot to keep that humerus in place. So we really need good stability. If you think we used to need to hang from branches, have our whole body weight coming through a single joint, but we need the mobility as well. We need to be able to move our arms in multiple different planes. And the whole shoulder joint is just that trade-off between getting maximum mobility in the shoulder, but still having enough stability to maintain the integrity of that shoulder joint. So the last thing we're going to look at are the muscles surrounding the shoulder, and you may know these as the rotator cuff muscles. So firstly, we have our supraspinatus above the spine of the scapula. Coming here above the spine, it's going to go th over our coracoid, underneath our acromion, and attach here to the superior border of the greater tuberosity. Then anterior to the scapula, between the scapula and these ribs, we have our subscapularis, that's going to come through here, it's going to come anterior to the humerus itself and attach to our lesser tuberosity here. Then posteriorly, under the spine, our infraspinatus posteriorly is going to come round the, uh, the humeral head here and attach to this middle portion of our greater tuberosity. And slightly inferior to that, we have our teres minor also coming around the humeral head posteriorly, attaching to the inferior border here of our greater tuberosity of the humerus. So we have our greater tuberosity that has our supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and our teres minor attaching. And we have our lesser tuberosity here with our subscapularis tendon coming all the way to it. In between here is our inter intertubercular groove, we have our, or our bicipital groove. We have our long head of bicep tendon running through this groove over the top and attaching to the bicep anchor on top of our labrum here, our superior labrum here. Now this is the only tendon in the body that is actually intracapsular. That tendon runs through the capsule of our glenohumeral joint. Our long head of bicep goes there. So where does our short head go? Well, our short head comes up to our coracoid process there. 
Now you can see with these lines here, I mean, this looks like a Picasso drawing. There's so many different components around the shoulder, but you really need to have a good understanding of where these anatomical components lie in relation to one another in order to able to identify them on a single slice in an MRI. So the shoulder has many points that stabilize it. Superiorly, we have our bony processes. Our chromium and our coracoid prevent that humerus from riding up. We've got the supraspinatus tendon coming up. We've got our long head of bicep tendon as well. Those all prevent the shoulder from uh, subluxing superiorly. Anteriorly, we have ligaments. We've got our superior, our middle, and our inferior glenohumeral ligaments, as well as our subscapularis tendon coming anteriorly. Now, we don't work with our arms behind our back, so those are, ten those are ligaments that prevent the shoulder from going further back. But we need to be able to bring our arms forward in front of our body. So posteriorly, we don't have any set ligaments holding that posterior capsule stable. It's our infraspinatus and our teres minor muscles that can stretch that provides stability to the posterior section of our shoulder. And that allows us to move our hands freely in front of us. We can afford to have ligaments on the anterior that prevent that arm from coming behind us, but we need that mobility in front. And that's why we don't have glenohumeral ligaments around the back of our shoulder. So with all that being said, let's get into the MRI scans and identify these structures there. So let's start with this axial PD, a proton density MRI of the shoulder. And we try and get our bearings first. As with any MRI, we need to understand where we are. So we can see we're at the level of the head of the humerus here. And if we scroll down, we can see that this is actually our glenoid. You can see how shallow that glenoid fossa is. Now, the best way to figure out which is anterior and which is posterior is to find our glenoid and then see our coracoid process coming off. It's this little hook shape coming anteriorly. When we see that, we know that this is the anterior portion of our scan and this is the posterior portion of our scan. So as we scroll up superiorly, we should see our acromion coming into view. So we can see our acromion here coming back down to the spine of the scapula there, our acromion coming up, and our acromion articulates with our clavicle here anteriorly. So we want to look at the bones. Let's look at the acromion. Sometimes we can have a separate os, a part of the acromion that has yet to fuse. And either that's because we have a young patient or it's a normal anatomical variant called an os acromial. And people who have an osochromial with this extra bit of bone sticking out that hasn't yet fused to the acromion can be more prone to having some form of impingement. And it's good to let our surgeons know if there is an osochromial. So we look at the bones there. Let's scroll down inferiorly and go and look at our glenoid. This glenoid should be a good triangular shape like this as we scroll all the way down through it. And we should be looking here on this anterior edge, especially the anterior inferior edge, that we don't have any bony bank heart lesions. That's when the shoulder dislocates anteriorly and causes this anterior inferior bit of bone to break off. And we can see that this is a normal glenoid. As we head up superiorly, let's have a look at our coracoid now. You can see our coracoid process. Now we know the, the short head of biceps tendon as well as our coracobrachialis tendon attaches here to this anterior portion of our coracoid. And as we scroll down, we can see those tendons going into the arm there, all the way up to our coracoid process. Now, there's a really important tendon that I mentioned earlier called the coracoacromial tendon that makes our coracoacromial arch that then houses our subacromial subdeltoid bursa as well as our uh, supraspinatus tendon. So let's try find that tendon. It's sometimes easier to go up to the acromion, find the tendon here, and follow it back down to our acromion. So there it is coming off. One slice up, we can see it coming. Here it is, all the way up, up, and to our acromion there. Let's have a look at the humeral head itself. We start at the superior surface of the humeral head, work down, we want to see a really round shape, especially on the superior portion of the humerus. It needs to be really round here. We want to look on this posterior surface here for any heel sacs, sacs lesion. Again, if you anterior dislocate and you impact this portion of bone on that anterior inferior glenohumeral rim, you might get a defect here on the posterior surface of our uh, humeral head. Work our way down, look at this nice smooth surface here, interacting with our glenoid fossa. We can see our bicipital groove here with our biceps tendon in it. That is all also normally anteriorly, and you can see when we take these MRIs, we want the patient just in slight external rotation to put tension on the subscapularis ligament so we don't have a big floppy subscapularis in front of us. 
keep working our way down. We are on a proton density image here. So what it does is it, it's got long TRs and short TEs to try and negate or e even out some of those T1 and T2 effects. So we see we've got relatively bright fat, but it's less bright than it would be on T1. And we've got relatively bright fluid if we look in our joint here, but it's less bright than on T2. Work our way down into the humeral shaft. We can see that there's no bony defects. We've got a good strong cortex there all the way through. Let's have a look at some of our ligaments. First, I'm gonna go right down to the inferior glenohumeral ligaments. These glenohumeral ligaments, they are form part of the capsule, the glenohumeral capsule, and they're basically just thickenings of those capsules. They're not discrete uh, or finite ligaments in themselves. They actually form part of that capsule, and they're just generally thickenings of that capsule to reinforce the capsule. So going down inferiorly, we can see that this patient has a pretty thick uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament. And as I'll show you now, when I drew on that x-ray, we had that dipping down of our inferior glenohumeral ligament. This is the bit that dips down and then comes back up. So we can see there's two layers of this glenohumeral ligament here. We've got an anterior section and our posterior, so we can call this our anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament and our posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. As we work our way up, we should find ourselves getting to the labrum itself or the glenoid fossa. Can work our way up and we can see our middle glenohumeral ligament here, then attaching to the glenoid. And as we head up further, we can see our superior, it's very thin here, our superior glenohumeral ligament. Here it is out here heading down. These are a little bit easier to see on some of our other scans. Let's now have a look at the labrum itself. And our axial view is really good at looking at our anterior and posterior sections of the labrum. So let's head our way right up to the top of the labrum. Here, this is where our long head of biceps is gonna attach. And what we want to see is this anterior fold of the labrum here. It's nice and dark. We don't want to see fluid coming into this labrum or coming right across that labrum. That might be a tear. Now, we must be cautious, our superior and anterior portion of that labrum, there are some anatomical variants that allow for fluid to come here. What we really want to pay attention to is lower down, our anterior inferior section of that labrum. That's where our anterior, our common, most common type of dislocation, our anterior dislocation happens. And that's where we can get our bank heart lesions, where we get disruption of that labrum or tearing of that labrum. So let's head down, we can see the labrum there, nice and defined, and as we head up, we can see it's nice and dark, no fluid coming into this labrum. Posteriorly, sometimes the edge is not as sharp, but we still want to see a nice posterior labrum there. Okay, and finally, we said we're gonna look at the muscles, so let's head our way all the way up, and this is why I've started on an axial slice, because we take this axial slice and then we get our coronal and sagittal planes into the right plane once we know where our supraspinatus tendon runs. So as we come all the way to the top, we know our supraspinatus runs over the head of our humerus here. So we see our head of our humerus, we come up, we can see our supraspinatus tendon here that's going to go over and attach to the superior part of our greater tuberosity. We look at the muscle bulk of the supraspinatus. If we've got a supraspinatus that's not working, patients will struggle to do that first 15 degrees of abduction. So our deltoid, when our arm is down by its side, our deltoid's got no mechanical advantage. It's our supraspinatus that lifts it out slightly, then our deltoid takes over. So we want to look at the muscle bulk of the supraspinatus and then look at the tendon. It should be nice and dark. There shouldn't be any bright patches within the tendon. So we can see that coming down nicely there and attaching to the greater tuberosity, the superior aspect. You can see as we scroll down, we'll lose our supraspinatus and it'll be replaced by our infraspinatus below the spine of the scapula. I'm gonna keep heading down until we're at the level of our humeral shaft here. As we head up, I want to see these tendons coming in. So below our infraspinatus is our teres minor. So this is our teres minor tendon. We can follow it up. It's gonna wrap around and attach to the inferior portion of our greater tuberosity. As I scroll up further in the image, we'll see these tendons here of our infraspinatus accumulating, accumulating, and coming up and also wrapping posteriorly around to the middle portion of our greater tuberosity. At this level, we should have our subscapularis coming anteriorly. So let's go a bit higher. As we scroll down, we see the body of our subscapularis here, a nice big tendon coming around. We want to follow that tendon all the way around to our lesser tuberosity here. 
So our subscapularis comes anteriorly. It's the only rotator cuff muscle that comes anteriorly. And it attaches to this lesser tuberosity here. Now that we're at this level, we can see the bicepital group. We can see this dark tendon here, our long head of bicep tendon. Now if this bicep tendon was to dislocate, we would inevitably get a disruption of this uh, subscapularis tendon here or rupture of the subscapularis tendon here. So we want to look at the integrity of this tendon as well as identify that long head of biceps tendon within the bicepital group. Let's follow that bicep tendon all the way down into the, into the arm. So we can see it here. As we head up, we can see it running in the groove, in the groove. As we head up, it's gonna run anteriorly here and attach to the superior portion of our labrum here. This is what's known as the biceps anchor. And we'll be able to see that better on our coronal views. But we can follow that tendon all the way down. Perfect, so it's a lot to cover. Let's go over to our coronal views. So what we want to do is, our coronal is not a true coronal. If we're at the top of our scan here, we can see that our supraspinatus runs anterolaterally here. And we want our coronal views to come exactly perpendicular to this tendon. So actually a coronal oblique view. We want to cut this shoulder like this all the way across. So let's have a look at our coronal. We can see our supraspinatus here coming across to the superior border of our lesser tuberosity. But again, we need to figure out where is anterior and where is posterior. And the way we do that is exactly the same as an axial. We look for that coracoid process. So let's find our glenoid. And we see what is continuous with the glenoid coming out anteriorly towards us. This is our coracoid process. We know we are anterior here. We can see our coracoclavicular ligament coming there. And if we follow across, we can see our coraco acromial ligament. You see it there from the acromion coming all the way across to the coracoid. So now we know we're anterior. Let's have a look at the bones themselves. We can see this part of the clavicle we can see coming across to our chromioclavicular joint here. We can look at our acromion coming all the way across to the spine of the scapula. We can look at the glenoid fossa here and then look at our scapula coming down. And as we come more anteriorly, we can look at the coracoid itself. You can see the ribs here and the lung fields there. So now we know we're anterior. Let's look at our subscapularis because that's an anterior structure. We can see our subscapularis has these really defined uh, tendons coming through, wrapping around that anterior part of the humerus and attaching to this lesser tuberosity of the humerus. We need to look at the integrity of these tendons and we can see that they're really well defined here. It's a normal subscapularis tendon. Then we can look at our supraspinatus here coming over the top of our humeral head. We look at this large tendon coming all the way around. We want to see dark tendon coming down and attaching to the superior portion of our greater tuberosity. Now this light segment here is actually uh, most likely an artifact called magic angle artifact. And that's something I will cover in a future video. We can see our chromion here with our coracoclavicular ligament. And that is just superior to this light structure coming through here, which is our subacromio subdeltoid bursa. And that's a bursa that allows that ligament to slide really smoothly as we move our humerus. And this can get inflamed. It can uh, become very angry looking, swollen. And it's a structure that we need to identify whenever we're looking at this coronal view of the shoulder. Again, also if we have rupture of tendons or we've got joint fluid coming out that can also leak into the bursa and then we get distension of that bursa not necessarily inflammation but distension of that bursa so we've looked at that ligament let's look at our infraspinatus and teres minor we want to head posteriorly further we can see our acromion we can see the tendon forming on our infraspinatus and lower down our teres minor and we head all the way back we see it wrapping around the posterior surface and the infraspinatus here attaches to that middle segment of our greater tuberosity and our teres minor to the lower segments of our greater tuberosity. Let's have a look at some of the glenohumeral ligaments here. We're going to come anteriorly again. We should see folding down here. This is quite thick here on this scan. This is perhaps a little bit thicker than normal. We've got our anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. And this is what's known as our axillary recess. So if this part of the ligament breaks off the humerus, we get a haggle, so a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. Or if the glenoid part avulses off or breaks off, we get a gaggle, a 
glenoid avulsion of the glenoid humeral ligaments. And fluid will track either towards the glenoid or towards the humerus, depending on which part of the ligament is avulsed. It's a little bit more difficult to see, but we can see here our superior uh, glenohumeral ligament just before our biceps tendon attaches to this biceps anchor. And quite difficult on this coronal view, we can try and see our middle glenohumeral ligaments. It's a little bit difficult to see on this view. Okay, lastly, we're going to head over to our sagittal PD. Again, start with the bones, get our orientation. Where is anterior and where is posterior? We can see we're at the level of the, of the head of the humerus. So we want to go in and find our labrum, which you can see here nicely. And then we want to see that coracoid process coming off. Our coracoid is anterior, so we know this is anterior, this is posterior. This will be our clavicle, this will be our acromion. So we can see our coracoclavicular ligament there should be able to follow this ligament all the way across to our acromion. And it's this arch that I've been talking about, our coracoacromial arch that runs from our coracoid through our coracoacromial ligament to our acromion that makes this arch over our supraspinatus tendon, our biceps, long-headed biceps tendon, and our subscapularis ligament. What we can see is inferior to this coracoclavicular ligament is our subacromial subdeltoid bursa running there. Again, let's have a look at the muscles. So scroll back and we can find this Y shape that we find. We've seen that on our approach to shoulder x-rays video. I'll link that above if you haven't seen it. Here we can see our supraspinatus muscle. Let's follow that muscle all the way through. Look at the tendon itself. We should be cutting this tendon in cross section and we can see that tendon running all the way there. It's gonna be difficult to see where it inserts because our greater tuberosity is right at the end of our plane, but here it is inserting to the superior portion of our greater tuberosity. So we want to look for any tears within that tendon itself. We can look at our subscapularis. It's got multiple start points, but it all comes and accumulates anterior to the humerus here, running forward and attaching to our lesser tuberosity. We can see our biceps tendon is going to be coming up in between those two tuberosities there. There's a space here called the rotator interval. Our supraspinatus tendon, the anterior border, and our subscapularis tendon, this superior border, makes a space here called the rotator interval. This is where a lot of in, uh, inflammation can happen in, say, a frozen shoulder. And our long head of biceps tendon, you can see it running here, runs through that rotator interval here, coming up through and attaching at the superior aspect of our labrum at our biceps anchor. So this is a really common review area that we need to look at. It's known as our rotator interval. While we're here, we can see our biceps anchor. We can see our superior glenohumeral ligament. You can see the uh, inferior glenohumeral ligaments, our anterior and posterior, and our middle thickening of our middle glenohumeral ligaments. Let's follow that uh, long head of biceps tendon here. We can follow it back towards us, and it's going to come down through the bicepital groove, coming up, following around, and up to our biceps anchor. Now the last muscles we're going to look at are our infraspinatus and our teres minor. You can see the bulk of our infraspinatus here and our teres minor down here. We follow the tendon forming. Here's our teres minor tendon. Here's our infraspinatus tendon. As we come more lateral, they're going to come posterior, join a little bit with the supraspinatus tendon, and provide that stability posteriorly as we come to our greater tuberosity there. Perfect, so it's a lot to take in, but the way to approach these MRIs is to look at the bones, look at the ligaments, then look at the labrum and the capsule itself before moving onto the muscles and going through each one systematically. And that way you're gonna ensure that you don't miss obvious things or obvious abnormalities on a scan. Again, as with anything, arguably knowing the anatomy, knowing what's normal is actually more important than knowing what's uh, abnormal. Lastly, I just want to mention, we've been looking at PD images where the fluid and the fat are both bright and signal and if you want to figure out is this fluid leaking into a space or is this just a fatty filled space then we can do fat saturated images here i've chosen not to look at those fat saturated images because the fat here gives us nice clear boundaries of our muscles and make things a lot more easier to look at but remember you can always choose a fat saturated image to differentiate between our fluid and our fat in the image so it's a lot to take in. I hope you've managed to follow along. Let me know what other MRI scans you want me to do. Do you want me to do the knee, the pelvis? Let me know and I will ensure that I do it for you all. Otherwise, I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.